I'm always intrigued when a German manufacturer decides they want to make an affordable, compact car. This is a strange class for those automakers to play in. What BMW has done here is build a car the size of a Toyota Corolla with the four-door BMW 228i X-Drive Grand Coupe that should be right around $30,000. This BMW 228i is, wait for it, nearly $48,000, and it's playing with these others that are almost half that. But the question is, is this a better choice than the much less expensive, traditionally front-wheel drive cars? You're watching Everyday Driver. We make a TV show, podcast, and YouTube channels dedicated to great cars, driving adventures, and helping you find a car you'll love. Subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss a thing. So what about the other competitors? There's a lot of them in this segment. There's Mazda 3s, there's Hondas, there's all kinds of cars. I'm driving the Volkswagen Jetta, the 2020 Jetta R-Line. The GLI could be considered one of the competitors in this class, but I like the fact that the R-Line keeps the price down just over $24,000. And it does come with a lot of standard features. This is cheap. It's six-speed manual, and it weighs less than 3,000 pounds. That checks most of the boxes we're looking for to find a little enthusiast car. The exterior design is fine. It's not striking. It's inoffensive. Just so throttled back, just so held back. In spite of the great value price, the look of this car seems expensive. You sit down in the interior and at first glance you think it's incredibly nice in here. I love the materials on the dash. It looks very stately and it looks very high end. The problem is the farther down the cabin you look, the worse things get. By the time you get to the pockets on the door panel here, these are some of the flimsiest pieces of plastic I've touched in a car in a long, long time. The instrument panel is just a couple of circular analog gauges and a square dot matrix display in black and white. There's no fun, there's just information. It's like the automotive equivalent of an infographic. The whole navigation and radio system here is fantastic. That all looks very classy, except just below that is where the vents are. The vents for the center of the dash are almost down with your knees. That is far too low to be successful. Compacts just generally mean non-performance, people movers, you spent your money well. So here we are in the 2021 Corolla XSE. Is there something here? This is the middle of the pack on price. This is almost $30,000 and it's just over 3,100 pounds in weight. So it is the dead center of this comparison. The Corolla has good driver cred. Historically, it was a rear wheel drive, inexpensive fun car, but for the last couple decades, it has not been fun. It's actually quite distinctive, and it does take on the corporate look for Toyota, but it's pretty aggressive. To do that and make interesting shapes that tie in with what you're seeing, especially the face of the car that sets the tone, does the instrument panel have to look like this? No, it could just be a slab. This has vents right below the nav screen, and they're just high enough. They're about the middle of your chest. They will actually cool you off pretty well. The seats in the Corolla are actually powered seats, unlike the Jetta, and they aren't quite as comfortable, but they are far more adjustable. None of these are overly spacious in the back seat, but the Corolla feels like it has the most. It's pretty close to the Jetta. They definitely have more than the BMW. I understand about BMW wanting to enter this market because this will sell. This is a market that sells cars. The exterior has the kidney grills. It's got all the BMW recipe, the Hoffmeister kink, the headlights, the lower cooling. It does look a little bit sporty how it sits and it's small and compact. And with that M Sport package, you get the rear spoiler, which is nice. And the storm gray color is lovely and I do like it. It looks quite a bit like the Corolla from some angles and from other angles, it just looks kind of droopy and melted. The interior is actually quite nice. I like the octagons and the half hexagons and Still interesting, kind of driver focused, but definitely beautiful. Everything you touch feels like quality. The upper dash materials, the things that you actually see a lot, aren't much better than they are in the other two cars. What's interesting is where you start to see higher quality materials is down at that knee level and below where the other cars get cheap. 
keep in mind that in this class you are buying four seats and four doors. This is supposed to be a usable class. The other two have significantly more room in the back than this 228i Grand Coupe. This is the most expensive car playing in a new segment for BMW where others have room in the back and they've made a car without enough leg room and cramped headroom in the back of a four-door four-seat car. Everyday Driver is brought to you by Covercraft. Use the code EVERYDAY for 10% off your order. The Jetta has a 1.4 liter engine. You thought 1.6s were tiny. 1.4, 147 horsepower, 184 pound-feet of torque. It doesn't sound like a lot. Okay, you're right, it's not very much. But that turbo makes up for a lot. This does have a competitive zero to 60 in its class. We're talking right around eight seconds. So in that regard, I guess we're equivalent. But the suggestion from this very eager turbo engine is that it's going to be a fast car. And in low speeds, it has a lot of pickup all of a sudden because it hits full torque at 1400 RPM. Okay, now we're moving. Oh, it broke loose. Look at that. There is some excitement in here. I didn't think so. But the car only weighs 3,000 pounds. You would think this would be incredibly fun to drive. It checks all those enthusiast boxes, and yet, it is not. Pretty much every automotive journalist says, if only blank car were offered in a manual, it would be better. And nobody defines what better means. The Jetta is the only one of these three cars that has the manual. And you'd think, well, there we go, what a relief. I've got a manual transmission. That means there's some fun to be had. And you'd be wrong. This manual is one of the worst I've ever driven. I mean, it's truly abhorrent. You take your foot off the gas to shift, it will climb in RPM all on its own. There's not just rev hang, there's a rev increase. That's me off the gas and it goes up at least 500 RPM, it goes up it kills any kind of driver engine interaction that you're used to. You want the eight-speed automatic. This is just frustrating. And at this point, driving the Jetta, the 2020 Jetta, I don't understand what Volkswagen's corporate goals are. I know there's a lot of electric cars coming, and I hope they're interesting and delightful, but this is not one of them. Toyota has definitely simplified by making this a two-liter four-cylinder that is just naturally aspirated. 170 horsepower, about 150 pound-feet of torque. It is down on both numbers from the BMW. It's kind of a mixed bag trading punches with the Jetta. The difference is, of course, the Jetta being a turbo has an initial punch way beyond this engine. And because it's a CVT, this kind of rubber bands and mutes the amount of power that it has. On this Corolla, if you put it in manual mode, you are now able to pick from 10, count them, 10 pre-selected ratios that want to act like gears. Of course, this is a CVT, a continuously variable transmission, so the gears are alive. They're just a pre-chosen ratio. That is a good way to get the transmission to, well, I don't know, listen. It downshifts almost as quickly as an automatic transmission, like the good ones nowadays that actually are kind of crisp. But interestingly, there's a physical first gear launch only on the SE and the XSE models that have the CVT. <laughs> it wants to pull. <laughs> this CVT follows your instructions better than many automatic transmissions that have paddles. You're going to impress no one with your acceleration here. This is a zero to 60 in about eight. This is not a fast car. It isn't a pleasing sound, but it's a sound that builds as the power builds. So it's very easy to learn almost subconsciously where the power is going to be and where you need to shift. Check out this, power. <laughs> I do love turbos. Ooh, yeah. I just want to warn you now, you think you're not going fast, but BMW has very successfully done again that German subterfuge that conceals the feeling of speed from you. It's definitely continuing BMW's tradition of under-reporting their numbers. Whatever number they say, the car will feel faster. 
thankfully this has the same 8-speed automatic with great paddles that you'll find in other BMW product. So this is a dual clutch challenging automatic transmission and it listens so quickly. The shifts are near instantaneous. They very rarely disrupt you like some of the shifts on the other cars. It's a rolling surge. Once you're in the turbo and once you're in that torque band, just prepare and budget for tickets, plural, because you're going to get them. So yes, a good part of your money is going to that power delivery that you just can't find in the others. However, I don't know how often you're going to use the real power of this car. If you're going to use this as an economical commuter, how often are you going to be deep enough in the gas pedal or clicking your way through the shifts fast enough to be glad that you have that extra power. I think that's the thing you're going to notice the least. What really separates this from other cars in the class are the modes, the sport, the comfort, and the eco modes. There is a massive difference between the modes here, and combined with the power of this car, it just moves. You're going to be shocked. The X-Drive is distributing torque up to 50% to the rear, and that's why this thing is so fast. It puts the power down. Everyday Driver is brought to you by Haggerty. Let's drive together. What's cool about the Jetta, it is the lightest car here. It is 2,900 pounds, under 3,000 pounds. It does kind of feel like that on the road. I'm dancing around a little bit here. It feels like a lightweight car. Traditionally, one of the great things about German automobiles is body control, and that's because they have to deal with a car that's going to be sent high speeds down the autobahn. In the case of this Jetta, it does have an initial turn in that is very sharp. Anything off the center line, it instantly is moving. There's no dead spot at all. Then it does the thing that all of these cars do, and that is there's significant body roll that you can feel until it settles the weight. The problem is that once the Jetta settles the weight, then it wallows some more. It can't be relied on. It isn't consistent in the way that it goes around a corner. Now, part of that is that torsion beam rear end. The rest of it is just suspension tuning in general. Now, maybe you commute and you never get over 30. The Jetta would feel fine. You're never going to discover any of the issues we're talking about. But for us to have a manual transmission in a little turbo front wheel drive car, we expect some level of dynamics. We expect some level of fun. I am the least confident in this car. The chassis is not giving me a good, comfortable, solid feel through corners. It didn't know how to hold a line. And there's a lot of cars that aren't performance cars and they can hold a line. The precision is not there and there is no feel. There's no, nothing here. It just steers is all. It just changes the horizon, changes the lane, and it steers. Handling on the Corolla is pretty impressive, actually, especially after that Jetta. Now, this does have a multi-link rear suspension. It doesn't have a torsion beam, and folks, it matters. The initial turn-in on the Corolla is actually a little bit slower than the Jetta. It darted in a little bit faster, but this car is consistent. When you put it into a turn, yes, you get that body roll, very similar to the Jetta, and it settles its weight to one side, but then it settles and sticks. It doesn't wallow, it doesn't become unreliable. It's going to do what you've asked it to do, and it's going to stay the course. Now, interestingly enough, the ride here is not quite as good as it was in the Jetta. That's the reason that the torsion beam is loved, because it transmits less vibration to the cabin. There's a lightweight chassis that is kind of playful. And even though there's not a lot of steering feel or road feel or car feel, it does hold a line. This car weighs 3,200 pounds. It does feel heavier than the Jetta. But what's interesting is a lot of the weight feels like it's now behind you. All of the weight felt like it was in front of you in the Jetta. Here it feels like the back half of the car is the part that got heavier. And honestly, after the floaty back end of the Jetta, this feels comforting. If BMW is selling something in this space, you'd like to think that the handling is going to set it apart from everything else in the class. But it isn't that much better than what we have elsewhere. It has the M Sport, it has the premium package, which gives it the M Sport steering, and it does have M Sport differential that acts like a mechanical differential. 
And that's combined with BMW performance control, like torque vectoring, except that it's brushing the brakes of the inside wheels in a turn to give it less understeer. And you do feel it, and that does con contribute to a precise line. But the big problem is that all 3,500 pounds of this car feels like it's right over the front wheels. It feels heavy. This, let's be honest, it's a front wheel drive chassis with all wheel drive to kind of hide that fact. What's interesting though is there's not much of a handling improvement over that Corolla and the body roll actually rolls over at about the same rate as the Corolla. There is a, a tauter catch to the body weight. It does feel a little more athletic when it stops its body roll, but just like the Corolla, the back end is planted because this also is a multi-link rear. But the good news is you can buy the dynamic handling package and add it to your car. It includes the dynamic dampers and the M Sport brakes and bigger wheels and tires. But now we're in $50,000 land. That's a different land, especially in a compact car that isn't a sports car. The only place you really feel a difference in handling between this and the Corolla is the fact that you can put your foot in the gas halfway through a corner and because it's all wheel drive, it sticks and rockets you through better. That's the only real difference. The Corolla handling is so close to this BMW that I think a Corolla owner could say, well, my car handles almost as well as yours does. For the Corolla owner, that's a victory. For the BMW owner, you should be disappointed. And when you consider that this car is nearly twice as expensive as the other cars we have here, this is nowhere near that good of a driving experience. When you come to the compact class, you want good standard features. You want it to be a good car. You want to feel like you've got a relationship with it. I feel like this is the coldest of the three. There's nothing here for me to love, to connect with. It feels like I'm driving a chair made out of stainless steel and rubbing alcohol. It's clinical. It's uninvolving. This, as a manual transmission car that has a little turbo engine and a six-speed manual, is such a disappointment from what you expect when you see those things on the spec sheet. It's like opening a birthday present from your favorite person to discover it sucks. Now, the cars in the compact class should have some inherent goodness. Corolla does suggest that. Does an overall package? Toyota's made the Corolla interesting and compelling. If you have almost $50,000 to spend on your commuter and you want to buy a BMW, I have to have four doors and four seats. Okay, you can buy the 3 Series BMW, which right now is excellent, for about the same money even more power, better dynamics, it's rear wheel drive, and the back seats you can actually use. What is this car doing in the lineup? It doesn't really compete with the actual things in this compact class, and it can't keep up with the other things BMW offers that are the same price. Should we look for driving fun even in the compact class? Are we bringing too much of a sport driving perspective to these cars? I say no, because in this category, there's so many cars available. What is it that pushes you as a buyer over the edge to choose one of these? Here it is, three different price points in the compact car segment, three different transmissions, yeah. and it does come down to fun. And after calling Corollas all these years, just a basic appliance, they started great, then they just went into appliance land yeah, or a toaster yeah, or a toilet. Yep. It actually has personality again. Isn't that amazing? I think you and I actually agree. First off, we agree, and that doesn't always happen. <laughs> but know. secondly, we have a manual transmission. We don't like that car. <laughs> we have yeah. a BMW that's disappointing and we have a Corolla with a CVT, and we both say it wins. Yeah, there's good interior space. The seats are fine, but I'm coming away feeling in every category, there's not something for me to love. You're saying to yourself, well guys, if only you had the GLI flavor, everything would be solved. And I disagree, because that would just make boring faster. To realize how close the price is of this Jetta to that Corolla and how much better the Corolla drives, in spite of having a CVT, that's, that's profound. It's profoundly terrifying, honestly. Corolla, in my mind, is now no longer synonymous with 
boring, tasteless, awful things to drive. There's some interest here. There's some fun. I like it when a car, even when it's not trying to be a car for car lovers or for great driving, is still set up well. And this is. I'm not saying this car feels like a miniature 3 Series. That's not what BMW is going for, really. It has to be excellent, but just keep in mind, you're, you're going to pay for it. Save the money. It's a commuter car. I don't think that this is worth the upcharge to get the badge. If you want a BMW, buy a better BMW for the same money. We're in a weird world. A strange, bizarro world where the BMW lost and the Corolla won and the car with the manual gearbox, both of us hated. <laughs>